Everybody has a story and every story needs to be heard. On this podcast, we are talking with each member of the General Conference Leadership Council. I'm your host, Alyssa Truman, and this is a and Profiles. Today we have with me Justin Kim, who is the recently appointed editor of Adventist Review Magazine. Or is it Ministries? Or what is it, Justin? Ministries. We do have two are the two main magazines, as you mentioned. One is Adventist Review, which tends to be more North America oriented. Started in 1840 something, I want to say 1849, one of the oldest magazines. And we got Adventist World, which is worldwide and more than a hundred uh, more than a million, more than a million subscriptions. I'm, I'm, I'm new to this job, so I'm getting my, my stats correct. But so we have those two are, are those two are our main print products out there. Okay, so Adventist Review Ministries mm-hmm. is it started off as the Sabbath. It started off as the Present Truth, Present Truth, uh, by James White back in 1849. And then it's gone through several names. Isn't it 1849? Uh, 1849. What did I say? I thought you said 1949. Oh, 19, no, 1849. I don't know. You might have said 1849. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever. Yeah, 1800s, 1840s. <laughs> well, and it was, it was, um, and then it, it trans- transitioned to uh, the word with review in it, and which is kind of a weird term that we don't use that today. But it was looking back and seeing which which articles uh, were part of the Advent movement, and they could put those together. There's another magazine called the Sabbath Herald, and those are all about the Sabbath messages. So they put all those together, and it was known as the, the Review and Herald, which the publishing house retains that name. But to, I mean, it's a long, complicated story. But today <laughs> it has evolved. Can you use that word? Evolved. I think it's safe. Okay. It's safe here yeah. now, on this podcast. Okay. Evolved right. is safe. <laughs> And then now it's the Adventist Review, and that's kind of where um, we've settled on for a while now. Okay. Yeah. Actually, my husband, his first job ever working for the church, he was mm. a designer mm. for, the, for the review. On the way. Yes. Very um, cool. One of my very first Christmas gifts to him, I bought him the very first piece of artwork that he commissioned oh, no from way. Nathan Green. Oh, um, wow. Yes. We went up to Michigan. We got it. And he actually, I think it took like 20 years for him to frame that piece of artwork oh, and wow. hang it in our house. But that's okay. <laughs> Not about Trent. Um, okay. Anyways, so we're go- we're today we're going to be talking about your life. Um, so... Mm. We're glad that we got a little plug about the review. We'll probably do a little plug at the end again, too. But we have a special connection. Mm. Um, we we like to joke around a little bit about. Um, yes. We are the 1980s babies. Yeah, not 1880s, but 1980s. Not, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Although my kids might sometimes think I am from the 1880s. Um, 1980, yeah. which I consider us GC young. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're, we're totally we're in our agree we're with that. low 40s. <laughs> yep. And um, this podcast, I was kind of joking, it was going to be a little bit shorter because we haven't had as many years to live. Mm. So we're going to have to really stretch this out. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about your parents. Yeah. So my parents are, are immigrants, uh, originally from South Korea. And they come, came over in the 70s, late 70s. Uh, came to New York. I was born in 1980. What part of New York? Queens, New York. City. Oh, so you're part of the city, not the state. Where? What, what, where where yeah, are you no, from? No, I'm from upstate New York, oh. and I'm just gonna say there's this whole like you okay. know state city. You yeah. know. Okay, but it's yeah. okay. You're from Queens. I Man. still like you because you are from 1980. I don't know. I gotta reassess my worldview now. <laughs> <laughs> you, you might, you might. <laughs> Anyways, and then we moved across the river, the Hudson River, not to upstate New York, but to New Jersey, uh, the wonderful, beautiful state of of New Jersey. <laughs> I was there for for a while. Um, I went to public uh, elementary school. Before we get to public school, right. I feel like we just like missed like seven years of your life. Oh, okay. Not, not well, much happened. Sense. I was a toddler. What do your parents and, do? Um, my dad was in the import, importing, exporting business with with uh, with South Korean goods for a while, and now he's in the manufacturing industry. Yeah. And your mother? And my mom just had in and out jobs, uh, just trying to make a living. Now, did you grow up Seventh Day Adventist? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that question. So. My dad had a somewhat of a Presbyterian background. My mom had somewhat of an Adventist background. 
Um, I don't really remember going to church when I was little. My mom said that she brought me to church when I was like uh, a newborn. She would sneak out of the house to go to an Adventist church. Um, in Korean sub sub circle and, and a, a subculture, there the the Presbyterians and Adventists are, aren't the greatest of of, uh, of communities with each other. And I think I was in third grade, second grade, fourth grade, some, somewhere around then where my parents just said, hey, we need to go to church because this kid needs some some church in his life. And my mom was like, hey, I'm, I, I, I can't go to Sunday church because from what I know, um, I think she got baptized right before she came to America. It was my grandmother. My grandmother is like the matriarch of faith. She's the one that's been praying for all her kids, praying for all the grandkids. And before she let her daughter go to America, she's like, you have to get baptized, whether it was legit or not or whatever, just you know, going through the process. And so that kind of still remained in my mom's brain. And so my dad and my mom went out to a Korean Seventh-day Adventist church in, in New Jersey. We drove an hour to get there, even there were other Adventist churches, but like, you know, Korean churches, for immigrants, like going to your own people's church is like a, a thing, like a huge thing. And then through some evangelistic series, my dad got baptized. I remember, uh, I don't know how old I was, but 12, 10, my dad got baptized in the swimming pool because we didn't have a, a baptismal tank in the church. So so you've moved to New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So at this point, you're in school. Yep. Um, your dad becomes an Adventist. Mm -hmm. How does that impact your family life? Yeah, so we were we were kind of Adventists, kind of not. But I just remember at one point, like we got rid of all of our, you know, um, gambling cards and you know anything that had to do like games. Um, we got rid of um, just a big trash bag came around, just throwing that stuff out. And then you know I remember we would go out to church and then go out to eat afterwards or go to movie theaters on Friday night, Saturday afternoon. But then that that all kind of like stopped suddenly and we didn't watch any TV all all Saturday. And, um, you know, Saturday morning cartoons was a big thing. And I remember that just stopped. Um, and and I just thought, okay, well, that's just how our family is. This, this is how all Koreans live. So that's that's cool. <laughs> I thought all Adventists were Koreans and all Koreans were Adventists. That was just kind of just all fused Adventists the two Korean, together. All Koreans were Adventists. Yeah. So this is a... <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very small world there. So all Koreans don't eat shrimp and pork, and all Koreans don't work on Saturday. And obviously, uh, yeah. <laughs> and you're a child like mine. That makes so much yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you continue though to go to a public school. Correct? I did, and I, I went to a Roman Catholic high school and a Jewish college. I know and I'm speeding forward. I don't mean to, but I just I just okay, had we'll different. We'll explore all of those <laughs> as we go. We just had different. I had different educational experiences. Uh, is, is, was which at the time was like pretty chaotic, but looking back on it, it's something that was very, very, very precious to me. Yeah. So I like to find out, like, as a young person growing up yep. in church, yep. um, obviously, you know, all Koreans are Adventists and all Adventists yeah, 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 are yeah, Korean. Yeah. <laughs> but um, what was your impression as a young person growing up in the Adventist church? Would you say that you had a, you know, everybody was very accepting or was it very, like, you know, hard lined? What was what was your impressions as a young person growing up in the church? Yeah. So that's a great question, Alyssa. Um. I don't know, as a child, it was just like, this is the way life is. Like, I didn't really even question that. So church, uh, my memories of, of my local church, very warm, loving people. We ate a lot for potluck. Uh, we set up chairs for the, at the gymnasium and then put them down and then had, you know, made it into the fellowship hall. Um, the preaching was in Korean, so I had, didn't understand the lick of the sermon, but Sabbath school was so in English. Do you speak Korean? I do. Okay. Yeah, but you know, preaching Korean tends to be on a different level than colloquial Korean. Okay. I, I don't um, know because I, yeah. I don't uh, speak yeah. <laughs> or understand Korean. Um, then we had our youth group, and I think the youth group provided a great social nexus for my faith. Uh, that's where we asked a lot of questions of like, you know, w questioning wasn't really a part of my faith because of the whole cultural language barrier. But having that youth group was like, oh, hey, so why don't we do this? Why do we do this? And it was an interesting thing. But yeah, I mean, I don't have, my my immediate family doesn't live in the East Coast. It didn't and still doesn't. And so the to church was definitely my my family. These are my uncles, my aunts, and, and, and uh, 
So in that sense, it was more of a cultural family than a religious spiritual family. Um, it wasn't until much later that um, that got into my, my my faith got really serious. So. I, I want to kind of talk a little bit about cool. the youth group. Yeah. Um, this is the, the best part about this because we have no idea what we're going to talk about. Yeah. It's like, all right, which thread are we going to yeah, randomly pull here? Yeah, scary. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I asked you if there's anything off limits and you said, no, we're good to go. Yeah, let's do it. So um, <laughs> a lot of times we hear mm. that, you know, when we ask questions, when young people ask questions, we're immediately just told, well, because the Bible says so or whatever. And you said that you were in this youth group where you were allowed to ask questions. Mm-hmm. What kind of responses were you getting? Mm, that's a great question. I don't know if we were allowed to ask questions, but we ended up asking questions. And then um, I think me coming from, I think a lot of us were from public school education. So it was, we were always the weird kids. We were the ones that were always gone on Saturday for all social activities. So a lot of these questions that come up and um, we had a variety of teachers, and then the ones that stick out to me were ones who, uh, many of them did not know the answers to these questions. But the ones who were nice, kind, loving ones, because they were so nice, and they just said, you know, that's just what we do. And it wasn't, there wasn't a Bible study, there wasn't a reason. And because it's just the way we do, then I guess that's the way we do, okay. right? Like that, I mean, there was, okay, don't ask, the, I mean, not don't ask the question, but that was, Enough, to, at least for me, satisfy for because they're a super nice person and I want to be like this person when I grow up, like an older sister or an older brother. Then there were also authoritarian figures that I really remember. And they said, you know, and there was no Bible study. There was no logic or rationale. Like, this is what we do. And just hard line. And that hard line, I think, caused, at least for me and the friends that I know, just to dig in our heels. But why? You know, and caused us to naturally just to go to the, the contrary position, you know? <laughs> um, and I don't know, because of that, and I'm, I'm exploring this now, but I just really believe like, you know, we're pendulums, you know? Mm-hmm. And whenever you stick hard on one side, a natural reaction is to gravitate to the other side. So I try to find some kind of balance and, and, and to lessen the momentum of the reaction when talking, especially especially with young people. Yeah. I. I had very similar kind mm. of a thing. I, I I would ask questions, but I don't actually remember ever anyone ever explained to me like the real reason why. Mm. But because of who they were mm-hmm. to me, mm-hmm. it was good enough. Yeah. Um, and it was much for me, it was my college years and like later high school years where I really started to explore. Mm-hmm. Um, but with my children, I have tried to take care of that pendulum because mm-hmm. yes, it's very easy for them to be like, mm-hmm. oh wait, what did you just say? So right. it's like you, yes, it. I, I resonate with that yeah, deeply. It's like playing counterpoint. It's like, you know, Bach, you know, you just do the high note and low note. I know and it's just, <laughs> anyway, I don't know that makes sense, but. It does, because um, I do I do know Bach. <laughs> um, let's explore, you said you went to a Catholic high yeah, school, correct? Yeah. All right, so you're an Adventist. I, <laughs> yeah. Who went to a public school. So I was baptized when I was 12. Uh, my, my grandmother really wanted me to be, you know, get Bible studies. And and it, it all made sense. I believe the Bible. I believe God. Hey, sure. I love church. Uh, and my grandmother came from Korea. I was like, hey, it'd be cool for me to get baptized in front of my grandma. I got baptized and, you know, she was on cloud nine. Um, they said, like, I was the next Timothy because Timothy's mother and grandmother were, were Jewish. And so the, here's his grandmother. And there was this kind of this big thing. But I didn't really own it. It wasn't my faith. My It wasn't, you know, no devotional life. It was just kind of by identity alone. Um, when I, I went to a Catholic high school, I guess your next question is why? Sure. Let's go with it. Let's go with why. A lot of people do ask, hey, why are you go to Catholic high school? So education is like a big thing for Koreans and for Asians and for immigrants in general. Um, the high school in my area was not a very good one, according to my parents. So they wanted to send me to some kind of prep- preparatory school. The local Abbas one had closed down a few years before. Uh, and they didn't want to send you to the boarding school. And they didn't want to send me to boarding school, yeah. And, um, and so the Catholic school was like the next best, best thing. And so they, they, we spent a lot of money. I, I was working. My parents also helped me with tuition, but it was a, it was a very good experience for me. Um, I saw that they were 
you know, in the back of my mind, I'm like, oh man, these are Catholics who are trying to brainwash me. My church members are like, what? And they're giving the evil eye to my parents. My parents are also a little bit anxious. What if this kid becomes a Roman Catholic priest? And, 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 and little did he know, little did they know, did they know um, that I became an Adventist, no, I Adventist pastor. Say, I was Adventist like, pastor. Then you, then you pastor. What? <laughs> um, but I, I, I met people there who I so, 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 so genuinely know that they love the Lord Jesus. Like they so love the Lord Jesus. Now, in terms of truth and Bible, I mean, they're totally wonked out and whacked out on some of these things. Uh, but I just saw another group of people like, man, these are genuinely spiritual people. Um, I had experienced racism in public elementary school and in the Catholic high school, I didn't experience anything, mm -hmm. just full acceptance. It was, and, and they weren't like, because we're Catholic, we're gonna love you. It was just kind of, it was a different environment. Um, and I remember, I was spending my adolescence not rebelling against the church or my family or society, but rebelling against the Catholic Church. Like it's just a great way to spend your adolescence. So you're rebelling because that's what principles you were kind of like learning in yeah. school. So you're gonna rebel yeah. against the- Yeah, and I was like sharpening, like I was sharpening my, my, my knife edge against, you know, Catholic, not Catholics, but Catholic doctrine. We had theology class every every day. And you know, we talk, talking about the Pope. And I'm like, well, why? Da, 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 da. And we're talking about you know, inspiration, tradition, the saints, um, the Eucharist, and then consubstanti consubstantiation and transubstantiation. I'll be raising my hand, and there was other Protestants in the in the school with us. I'd be like, we will raise our hands together and coordinate our questions against oh. the the priest. And the priest gets stumbled, or he he pull out some like wild card, like, oh, but we don't believe the Bible is the only you know, a document to resort to. I'm like, man, that's like cheating, man. And they have like, you got another thousand years of documents to like, you know, we use this and this and this. I'm like, well, I don't know those. And so it was interesting. So I got to know my Bible a lot more on a theological, theoretical level, you know, uh, but I loved it. I mean, it was, it was great. It was great. I, I actually love that you've, you've had these experiences with different religious um, communities mm. because a lot of us have grown up in Adventist bubbles. I was very much brought up in an Adventist bubble. Mm. Um, I went to church and actually I would say probably two thirds of the church were my relatives mm. in upstate New York. And um, <laughs> it, it's just for me, it's I it wasn't until I was probably 23, 24 and I went out and I started I had a job and all of a sudden I had all these non Adventist friends, mm. but it had not allowed me that time to be able to during those formative years to really kind of challenge and understand. Mm. So I love that you were able to have this. And I, I think it has helped you a lot with your fu future life career choices mm. um, without maybe even having known that that journey was going to help. Mm. So you graduate, mm. I'm going to guess like top of the class because the priest loved you and all <laughs> your questions. Um, I'm, you're not arguing with No, I, 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 I wasn't top of the class, I guess. <laughs> 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 um, yeah. And then you choose anyway. to go to which university? I went to Brandeis University, Jewish sponsored university near Boston, Waltham, Massachusetts. Uh, I got a scholarship to go there, uh, and uh, it was it was it was a it was a different experience there. Uh, Jewish Jewish university, so it's not all Jewish, but Jewish sponsored. No shrimp, no pork. This is making it really easy for the Avenus boy. Yeah, I can just say. I mean, Sabbath, like Friday night, like people are in a rush before sundown to get the place uh, clean. People are withdrawing cash back back when people had cash, you know, in their pockets, <laughs> and um, you know, just doing all their errands on Friday, and then Saturday it's just like quiet, peaceful, and then Saturday the sun drops, and it's just like these these Jewish friends are just partying their 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 partying a lot. Um, so, you know, it's it's a similar cadence to, to Adventism, Adventism um, but totally, in, in, a, in a certain sense, totally felt like a Gentile, you know, in the, in the Catholic world. Even though you aren't Catholic, hey, you're still part of the community if you participate. Uh, in the Jewish community, not so much. There's a little bit more sharper lines for, for uh, understandably so. Um, they had everything that Adventism had, but but no Jesus, <laughs> which is a big factor. And I always come, I always like kind of laugh that when Adventists talk about, "Hey, we're so legalistic and whatnot," I'm like, "You do not know what legalism looks like. Like the Jewish community has legalism down to an art form, and that's not a criticism. 
it's it's for them it's 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 meritorious i mean they it's it's a point of praise uh pride for them to do that and so you know Adventists do we, we do struggle with legal there are, there are some of us who do struggle with legalism but it doesn't come near with with what i think human beings are are capable of and i say that in, in a in a way that's we should be wary of you know it's been an opposite experience of my catholic high school so I have two questions specifically about your college. <laughs> One, yeah. what was your degree in? What did so, you decide yeah. that the brilliant Justin Kim was going to get a degree in? Um, I was a bio and social major, biology and sociology. I wanted to get one degree in the sciences because I felt that was like, you know, smart people study sciences. Okay. Uh, but then smart people are very social and they can't articulate, can't write. They don't, I can't communicate with anyone. They're just stuck in their, you know, microscopes. So I want, I, I wanted a social science <laughs> and so, psychology seemed a little bit too, too, too out there was sociology. I felt was a little bit understanding society, how large groups work and how, how to start movements and how to, how to large masses of people. I studied propaganda and racism and all the isms out there, political. I mean, it was just like just a wealth. It was just, it, it, it scratched every place that I was itching that the sciences did not uh, assuage. So you want to be a smart, articulate person. I didn't, I wasn't, I hated being in front of people. I did not want to be a public speaker of all things. That's that, the last. This thing is I actually hysterical. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So you're not going to be a public speaker. You yeah, just I just to wanted to on paper? understand the idea. Yeah, yeah, to write. Yeah. Okay, so and to be, I wanted to be a doctor, as as all as the proper Asian Asian male firstborn should be. Uh, a, a doctor. But, yeah. What were you going to be a doctor of? I wanted to do. So after graduating Brandeis, I, I was doing some stem cell research at Harvard Medical and, and Mass General Hospital, and I wanted to get into research and, and study, find cures to diseases and, and, and neurological um, uh, uh, decaying um, diseases and, and, and all these things. And I'm really excited because I know where you are now, and I cannot wait to figure out this journey of how to get there. Um, <laughs> But first, what do you think that Brandeis University taught you about you? Hmm. It's a great question. I don't know. That's I haven't I haven't reflected on that. What has Brandeis That's University what we're here taught for. me about me? Man, it's like a counseling session. This is good. This is good. Um well it taught me that that I need the Lord Jesus. It was hard. Brandeis was hard. Uh, being in high school, I was on the the top top tier of my class. High school was pretty easy. Uh, university years were hard. You take all the our class was comprised of all these top kids from all around the country and around the world. You put them together, and I didn't come anywhere near the top. Um, and they were all trying to vie for the same positions in society. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I know I wanted to be a doctor, but in my heart, like, I don't know if I want to go through all that and I don't know what, what's going to happen. The other factor in all that was 9-11 happened around mm. that time. So I'm like, man, the world's coming to an end. What am I going to do? Who am I? You know, and I think these aren't, maybe these aren't questions that Brandeis University brought up, but these are questions that were brought up during my time in college. And um, and religion, spirituality was the answer. I know it sounds so cliche and whatnot, but it was the answer for all those things. You know, not uh, relief from stress, uh, relief from the stress of classes and whatnot, but also like, why am I doing this, and and how am I going to get through this? It was I found no other solace than 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 church and Bible. You know, I I think we think it sounds like an easy answer. I was actually talking with my older sister about this this morning. Um, how can people who are raised in the same home hmm. end up very Having differently. Having different experiences. Um, and how do we each cope with stuff a little bit differently? Mm -hmm. And we are trying to figure out what part does our faith mm. have to do with how we deal with the issues that, that hit us every yeah. single day in our life. Because um, one of my siblings is an atheist, mm. um, has completely left the church. And we both struggle with a lot of similar um, health issues. Mm -hmm. And we were trying to figure out, like, what is the denominator? What makes the difference? The cause of divergence in your yes. guys' Yes, and is, it does, does our faith mm -hmm. journey um, make it so that it's a little bit easier to find that purpose in life and mm -hmm. to find that 
that thing. And we, we'd like to think it's an easy answer, but actually it's not an easy mm. answer because for many of us, as we're searching for these really deep things, it's actually something we've had to struggle with to get that to be the answer mm -hmm. because it's a lot of faith. Mm -hmm. um, the easy mm -hmm. answer would be something that is tangible. Mm -hmm. This is intangible. Mm -hmm. um, and I think September 11th changed a lot our generation, mm -hmm. especially. It was the very sure. first thing that was like, I remember the Challenger exploding yes, as a kid. In the 80s. Um, I think it was like 85. Is it? I don't know. It was like 85-ish. I remember coming down the stairs. But like the Challenger, I remember that was a very specific, well, maybe it wasn't 85. I don't remember. When we were young. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when we were young, the Challenger exploded. Yeah. Um, but 9-11 was, was a very hard time. Yep. Because it, it shifted who we were and it, it, something came to America and it really caused us to reevaluate. What am I doing? Yeah. Well, for, for me, it was like all those all those uh, religious teachings and the spiritual teachings and like the, the last day stuff that we were all taught throughout the 90s. <laughs> um, that was like the first sign. I would say it was one of the first signs. Yeah. One of the first signs that that all could be a reality. Yeah. Because before that, it was like, how can America be like this evil, you know, empire that's going to, you know, uh, how is it going to, you know, clasp hands, clasp hands with Catholic, you know, all these all these things that we in Adventism just we've we've been saying for a while. There's just impossibility. Right. I mean, we just we just conquered the Cold War and now America's, you know, the, the we're the good ones in the 90s and helping out the countries and the 9-11 hits. And then all these government things are happening, you know, civil liberties seem like they're eroding away month by month. I'm like, man, this can happen uber fast. Do you remember when, since, since we're 80s kids, this is, this is fun because I feel like we were at the same point in life. And I, I feel like a lot of the things that we were taught around that time period were about this, you know, the same kind of thing. But do you remember when um, the Iraqi war started? Mm. And I remember because it was my dad's birthday when when we went in and I remember thinking this was the end hmm. because it's in the Middle East, hmm. you know, and it's like you had this whole like, again, it was how we were brought up, yeah. you know, um, it, it, it's, it was an interesting kind of a thought process that immediately your mind goes to anything that happens in the Middle East or whatever, that somehow maybe this is the beginning of the end. And yeah, um, so. So you've now been able to go through Catholic education yeah, and Jewish education yeah, and you're doing stem cell research yep. at Harvard. Yep. Justin, how on earth, like, where do we go from here? Like something yeah. happens. What is, what is this pivotal moment? I feel like we're at this moment. I don't even know, but I feel like we're at this pivotal moment. Yeah. Something has to happen here. So while that's all occurring, um, right when I graduated high school, I was going to university. I had gone to a camp meeting. And at the camp meeting, there's which, this- Which camp meeting? This was a, the Korean East Coast camp meeting where the there's Koreans- There's a Korean East yeah, Coast camp meeting? Yeah, we, we got these things going on that no one well, else- come on now. Exclusive I just go to New York conference camp meeting. I didn't know there was like a special <laughs> camp meeting. Yeah, there's one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast uh, in North America. And so we went to the East Coast one. And we had a preacher come and this guy preaches the Bible in a way that it's not the normal cliche- Bible sermons. Like I used to believe that, you know, you would sin for six days and you come to church, you ask for forgiveness and you get grace on Sabbath. And then for another six days, you can continue sinning. Um, and I thought, the, you know, when you read the Bible, it's just like, you just have to know the general outline of each story, but you don't really have to know the Bible. But then I go to this, I'm listening to this preacher and this guy's preaching messages from these obscure stories and bringing out these things from each line and they impact like my life, what I'm going through like right then. And I'm just like, I've never heard the Bible be so relevant, be so pertinent, so real before. I mean, it was like the Bible was literally speaking to me, like every single message. And I realized that this transcended the speaker, this transcended camp meeting, like I need to get to know the Bible better because I don't know a lick of the Bible. I know Noah's story. I know of Abraham, da, 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 da. But I don't know. I don't know why it was written the way it was. I, don't, I, mean, I just don't know the Bible. I just, I was thirsting for it. And then he was bringing out like this, this person named Ellen White. So I grew up in the church. I did not knew, know who Ellen White was until I was about 17, 18 years old. 
right? They, they put her books in this like, you know, glass closet in the church library. And, and it was kind of discouraged to read her. Like, hey, you can maybe read uh, Desire of Ages and Steps of Christ, but some of the other stuff, like you might end up being a little, you know, extreme. And we, you know, that's, that's for the pastors to tell you how to. So I just avoided it. But going after the going to this camp meeting, I mean, he was bringing out all these things that Ellen White had predicted and all the benefits of the spirit of prophecy. What is the spirit of prophecy? The role of the spirit of prophecy? I'm like, what? What? 1840? What is 1840? Sanctuary? Like, I was an Adventist, but I had like no idea about these things. No idea. Hmm. And I'm, I just, I still get super excited to this day when I hear these things. And uh, there's a whole group of us. We grew up in the church and we heard about these things. We're like, what? Victory over sin, 1888. Some of these, these eclectic teachings of the church, but they're not eclectic. They're really core to who we are as Adventists. So that was going on inside me somewhere, right? And then on the outside, I'm going through college. I'm going to teach, I'm, I'm not teaching, I'm, I'm doing, I'm working at Harvard. And there's a, there's a, there's a clash point because the two trajectories aren't aren't really matching. And then I was at the hospital. I remember being at the hospital. I'm doing apologetics with these PhDs about creation and evolution. I'm giving Bible studies to the receptionist who's a Catholic and she wants to know about you know prayer and the saints. I'm, I'm talking to these atheists uh, from Italy and from Sweden about like purpose and meaning and like, and I'm enjoying that a lot more than chopping off mice heads and taking their brains out and then slicing them and putting them into film and then creating 3D models. I think of, we're good with that description <laughs> now, <Justin>. of, of, <laughs> of the cancer that's in their brain. Like, yeah, that the, it was, it was di- there was a divergence in my life. And I was like, Lord, what should I do? And I remember I was doing campus ministries, doing like three Bible studies a week. And I was like, man, th- I wanna do more Bible I wanna teach Bible I wanna talk about the Bible. Like, it's just, it's just percolating in me. So when you came back from camp meeting, yeah, you started doing all of this, or were you doing this before? Uh, we started to it, it, the four years was a, a work in progress. We started a group called Spark Students Preparing Adventists for the Return of Christ. You know, with a C oh, at the a end. C, not mm-hmm. a K. Yeah. Okay, I was like trying to figure out what the K was going to be. We went to the local churches out of our own dime. We do like revival weekends. And then, um, so we're going to like church to church to church, youth group to youth group to youth group. And eventually we got linked with a campus ministry group in in Michigan. And they're doing similar Bible studies on campus, but we like linked and then we met other people who were born in 1980. Of course, because, you know. Because 1980s. Sociologically, like, yeah, why, why don't we explain a little okay, bit about the right, 1980s right, right, right. here? Okay. So sociologically, those born from 1978 to 1982 are, are, are called cuspers. They're a transition point from one generation to another generation. So when we read all those, like you know, which which generation are you? Are you a millennial? Are you a boomer? Are you an Xer? Are you an alpha? Or whatever. Although alpha, anyway, <laughs> um, we don't really identify with with anyone. Part- we're, we're, we identify with Xers and millennials together. And so we play a role in society. We help transition from one society, one one generation to another, and we tend to be ambidextrous and understanding and being navigating through the annoyances of one generation and the weaknesses of a, of another generation. So, I so think we my, have superpowers. We are, we pretty much we are <laughs> we're, we're superheroes. My favorite part about this is that it's 1978 to 1982, mm-hmm. and my older sister was born in 77, and my younger sister was born in 83. So they don't even get to be a part of our. So cool their superpowers are. Denied um, it so it's just us. We yes. are the cool club. So, yeah. so you you met some other eighty uh, I mean, be this other person, nineteen eighty year, and we're like, hey, let's do something. Let's 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 do something for God, and let's let's start a Who little. Is this? this is Israel Ramos. Yeah, and he's a a, a punk kid, uh, Hispanic from California, uh, and then he was involved in campus ministry in 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 Michigan. He's got a wonderful long story there too, and we we just just the two of us just 
still to this day, uh, he's, he's my, 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 my brother in Christ, like just my best friend. But we just hit it off. We just, we're talking about Bible stuff. We've got similar sense of humor, but we got similar sense of like purpose and mission and what we want to do. Hey, let's do something. Let's do something for our generation. Like this is the greatest thing we can do for our generation. I wonder what it's going to be. Huh? Like let's get our friends word. together. You get your friends from like the spark, the, the churches that you visited and I'll get the campus ministry people. And then maybe like 50 people will show up to our thing, man. It's going to be the big biggest thing ever and we're gonna invite like speakers that we want we do bible stuff we're like fasting praying we're gonna like make it like uber spiritual like you know pump it up like to the maximum volume so i know what we're about ready to organize okay okay (laughs) but the purpose of organizing this Mm. was because you had had this life-changing experience yeah for sure and all of a sudden your faith had gone from tradition we go, every Adventist is a Korean, every Korean is an Adventist, yeah. right? Yeah. So we went from this tradition and just kind of knowing of the Bible, mm-hmm. not really even knowing the spirit of prophecy, mm-hmm. what that was, mm-hmm. to all of a sudden internalizing the word of God, mm-hmm. what righteousness by faith means, mm-hmm. that God wants to work in us and through us mm-hmm. and not just be out there. Mm-hmm. And you don't want this to be just something for you. That's right. That's right. And so therefore we start what is now known as GYC. That's correct. Like so, it, it was like, how is it that there's so many Adventists that have never heard of this stuff or they've heard of it, but it's just kind of like, like it's not internalized. Mm-hmm. And it was like, man, like I'm a sinner. Like I've heard that preached to me like so many times, but I am. But Jesus like saves me out of this and he doesn't it's not a temporary like it was i i think i was sensitive to just grace oriented sermons they're like hey god loves you god forgives you so go but there was no transformative um emphasis you know and that was what was discouraging but when it was like god transform what how does that work scientifically like how does what change like what how does a conversion work still to this day i'm 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 just and then that, that sanctification process is of a lifetime, but it helps you overcome. Uh, but that overcoming, your, your salvation isn't dependent on that, right? That was another thing that we had to understand. But these things were like just so, and I wanted everyone in my social circles to understand. And if they only understood this, they would, they would, they would just take church and Jesus and life and religion, and spirits, all that stuff seriously. And that was the burden for GYC. Eventually, I'm going to be interviewed mm. because I'm also on GCLC. But for me, it was very much the same. Mm. I, I grew up, we were in this church. Like, I mean, I didn't know who Ellen White was and stuff like that, you know, <laughs> but there there comes this moment where all of a sudden my faith became very real to me and all I wanted was for everyone else to know. Yeah. And to this day, I'm still grappling with it. Like, what does this mean? Like, mm. um, they had the big thing with revivals. That's like the big thing that we're all talking about right now. And I started pondering, like, what does revival look like within our lives? And it's like something that for like for like the last month, that's all I can think about. Mm-hmm. What do, and that's it's kind of what you're talking about. So you you and Israel decide we're going to get together, we're going to do something for our generation. Mm-hmm. So tell us about this first event. Yeah, so we just wanted like Bible saturation. We we're super poor. Right. So back then, a long time ago, you had to pay for sermons. And so here we are, students, we're like, we don't have money to pay for sermons. Why don't we just hold a weekend? What do you mean by pay for sermons? Pay for tapes, cassette tapes. Oh, oh, yeah. I about- <laughs> cassette tapes. Yeah. Yeah. Cassette tapes. Okay, so before yeah. streaming, before MP3s, before <laughs> CDs, <laughs> there were these tapes and you had to pay for them. So you got you got regular sermons from your local church pastor, which were great. Right. But like the good ones were recorded on 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 cassette tape, which is a plastic contraption, like yay big, you know, a square, a rectangle you put in a machine. And I mean- if you had to rewind the, it. Yeah, you had to rewind. Forth. It was great, it's, yes. It's, my, my children Turn have no idea a, what this is. With a pencil, staring at. That's right. The, oh, yes, 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 great. Yes. But we were poor, and so we're like, why don't we invite these people, and we can just have them preach like 10 times on one day, just juice everything we can out of them. And that's, what, you know, we just pay for their their flight or whatnot. So we created this, this get together and um, I remember, and I, I was directly fed by what was called American Cassette Ministries at the time. They changed it to American Christian Ministries. Man, my theological foundation and nexus in life is, is, is directly attributed to this media ministry. And back then, like sermons were rare to get. 
And then I remember when we got like a good sermon, we would like pass it underneath the table to our friends. We're like, Dude, you want to listen to this? Like you, this, this is about like, you know, uh, Roger Kuhn, Cliff Goldstein's, you know, latest series on Zachariah or Doug Batchelor, CD, CD Brooks, oh. uh, Breath of Life series. I mean, these names were like, you know, just big baseball cards. I mean, we're trading out these, 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 these commodities that we had. Um, now you you get every sermon for free on YouTube, right? And it's just you type everything in, and then there's so much. It's lessened the value hmm. of of each sermon message. You That's know? an interesting thought. I never yeah. thought of it that way. Yeah. So we started. I mean, because people are thirsting so much that why don't we create a venue? where you can come and you can meet all these speakers face to face, ask them your questions and then listen to like, what about six and seven of those sermons and you get, you know, interaction with kids or young people. And, and this is what we, we call GYC general, general youth conference is what we originally called a weird name. Uh, it's general for everyone, it's for youth and it's a conference. So then we didn't think it sounded like general conference youth at the time. Uh, we've had some interesting dialogue with the youth department as a result was the confusion and whatnot. But we wanted, um, it, it was definitely scratching an itch. Itching a scratch? Scratching an itch. Scratching an scratching itch. Scratching an itch. Uh, because we didn't get 50 people. We got yeah. 400 people the first year. You had 400 people. Yeah. Your first, where, where did you this hold this? This is in Pine Springs Ranch, California. They're coming out of the woodwork. We'd have nowhere to put them. So they're sleeping in bathtubs, uh, two random people to a bed in a twin bed, people sleeping in between the twin beds, totally blowing out the fire codes of the place. Um, next year we had 800 registered, but a thousand people show up on Sabbath. Next year after that, 2,000. Next year after that, 4,000. Then it goes international, and it just it's just it it went viral before viral was a thing, before the social media was around. So I mean, we were we were just this has to be of God. This isn't of us. And so now to this day, I mean, it's been 20 years. That was 20 years ago. And now GYC is all over the world in South America, Africa, Asia, Europe, and. GYC has now become kind of a household name in, in, in many Adventist circles. And it and it really just stems from two young men who had had, call it a conversion. Similar their experiences, conversion correct, experiences correct, correct. And wanted nothing more than for their generation. Yeah. Um, a lot of kids from the 80s. Um, yeah. And we'll take all, the, all our spectrums here. Yeah. But we just want them to know God. Yeah, that's right. So are you still working at Harvard now? So what happens here? All, all this is happening, and I'm like, why do I want to be a doctor? Like, why? Yeah, to the, the you know the, the heal them, and then you know, and then the trajectory was to go to Loma Linda and then become a missionary and whatnot. But just I wanted to get Bible training, so I was like, should I go to Amazing Facts College of Evangelism? There was another one, Black Hills, mm -hmm. with Louis Torres, and far away in South Dakota and edge of civilization. Um, so I may I'll just go to seminary. Last place that I wanted. I've never wanted to be a pastor, a preacher, a public speaker, but I just wanted to know about the Bible because I'd be talking with people and I get stumped. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how to answer that. And you have a really good point there. So I went to seminary and I was like, Lord, I'll just be here for one year. My parents were freaking out. They're like, you're not going to be a doctor. You're going to be a what? You can pastor. <laughs> And um, you do know there's a there's a pay difference between those two occupations. There's a pay difference. Uh, I'm like, yeah, no, I'm aware. So just just one year, just one year, and it was a two year program. So after one year, I'm like, hey, mom, dad, it's a two year program, so I might as well finish the year out. I'm already halfway through it, and I just got all these speaking engagements. I got called to be a pastor at the at the local Korean church there. I got picked up by the Michigan Conference, um, and just more and more, it just the Lord was opening more opportunities for me to preach and teach and to be a pastor. And then uh, six years later, five years later, I got ordained and became a pastor pastor. So for those six years, did you work at the Korean church in Berrien Springs? For two years, I worked at the Korean church in Berrien Springs. And then I worked at Campus Ministries, a Michigan conference, and I got picked up by Michigan Conference as a pastor. So real quick, because everyone listening might not fully understand okay. Adventism here. Okay. When we talk about the seminary, the seminary is at Andrews University, in which is in Berrien Springs, Michigan. Yes. Um, it's freezing cold there. Yes. Much of the year. Yes. Um, For 11 months. Yeah, 11 months. <laughs> and maybe an extra bonus week if we want, right? Um, 
what degree did you get while you were at? So I was there for their MDiv program and I switched to their MA program and then I never actually finished the program because I got picked up as a, as a pastor. Eventually I got a, a, a Matt Min. Matt Min. Uh, yeah. Yes, I know because I'm doing it yeah. now. So we, we have a <laughs> lot that we get to it. talk yeah. about, right? It's not just the 1980s, it's our Matt Min yes. program, which, which I want to actually kind of like talk about for a few seconds here. Okay. It's a fantastic program that the North yes. American Division offers. Yes. It's for people generally who are in ministry. Are in ministry or are thinking about going second career yes, yeah. into That's ministry. Right. Right. So maybe you've been a doctor mm-hmm. um and now you've decided you want to maybe go you feel God calling you to mm-hmm. ministry. And so they created the Masters in Pastoral Ministry, mm-hmm. um the North American Division in conjunction with Andrews. Mm-hmm. And it the Travel around. That's right. So, for instance, every union hosts two classes. Mm-hmm. And after four years, mm-hmm. if you go to the ones in your union, you're done. And if you calculate it the right way, you can go to many unions. Yeah, I'm not. And, I'm not quite and, there and, yet. And, and I, you can. You can. You can. You can punch it out, which is not recommended because I mean, it's, it's for those who are working uh, full time to to yes. be able to do that. And, yeah. and in this, I actually just finished um, Doctrines on the Sanctuary okay. with Davidson, which. Awesome. Can we just talk class? About, awesome professor. Yeah. He, by the time I was done, you had talked about like these core beliefs yeah. that we just don't know. Yeah. Here I've grown up an Adventist, and all of a sudden the idea of the investigative judgment. Yeah. I was crying because I could not wait for it to happen. Yeah. Like the man is so passionate, it helps you see God in so much, yeah. and it's like all of a sudden you're like the judgment, bring it on, just yeah. like yeah, David, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and yeah. um, it was. It was an incredible class, and I did Christian leadership in a changing world, which um, that book is. I'm reading a book in that class that's blowing my mind right now by Blackaby. Mm-hmm. But um, it, so I just wanted to give a shout out to yeah, MD no, for because sure. for sure because they're helping a lot of us who who want to be able to better articulate who who want to finish that masters yes um, to be able to do it to be able to work for the church that we love so deeply. Mm-hmm. And to be able to have the spiritual and theological knowledge we need in order to do so. Yes. So big shout out to NAD. Um, Amen. Esther Amen. Not Amen. Awesome. in ministry. Awesome. Love her. Um, anyways, <laughs> moving back to Marion Springs. I feel like at some point in your story, yeah. a beautiful woman has to enter. Has okay. she entered yet? No, she hasn't. Oh. She hasn't. Where, where do we get the entrance? So just in my weird, you know, like experience. We were talking I about just, your wife, just yeah, 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 yeah. Here. That's that's <laughs> I, I I picked up what you were throwing down. Um, I just I wanted to say, Lord, my twenties are for you, right? You know, and people are getting into drama and all this other business. Like I just want to like just laser line focus. And I was twenty nine at the end. Uh, about to turn thirty, I was like, "Lord, that was a long ten years. I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty, I'm pretty good. I want to get married, like pretty soon, because with a three in my in my my age digit, like that's 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 I'm on the upper limits now. And you gotta, you gotta help me out. And so that's when we had I had a a pastoral couple where I was good friends with the pastor, and he said, "Hey, you got to meet this girl. She's like she's like a perfect match for you. She's from Korea." And I'm like, "Ah, oh, you don't understand. The last thing I want to to link up with a Korean, and I know in her end." She didn't want to link up with an American Korean. You know, just they're not real Koreans. They're these like you know Americanized. You know, but we met. I was doing a series in Korea, and I had no other excuse. I had to to meet this person, and it was just like boom, we hit it. We had like a three hour conversation, just just natural um, as natural can be. We're talking about spirit of prophecy about you know life direction, meaning. It was just a really really great conversation the, the 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 pinnacle of everything i was going through and then she was also waiting for someone to have a similar kind of value system and for and the, the thing that was awesome was like she's like you know if i don't meet someone with this value system it's okay i'll just be single like why do i have to compromise some of these mm-hmm. things and then uh, I, I had a similar perspective like there's just to get married for the marriage sake anyway so we got we got uh we got we got married yeah what is, we got married three times we got married three times well what is her name? And her name is why? Rachel. Rachel Chihyun Kim. Uh, we got married once in America, once in Korea. Uh, it's another story there altogether. Uh, but we got married again legally in America for the the, the immigration thing. It got, gets complicated. It's not very interesting. But that's what happened. <laughs> You're like, it's not interesting. I got married three times. You totally not interesting, times. guys. Yeah. Okay, we're just gonna move on because it's not interesting. Um. So she moves to America. She does. 
and your campus ministries? So I was camp, uh, what was I doing? I was communications director and Sabbath school director at Michigan Conference at the time. Okay, mm-hmm. so you've done campus ministries. Mm-hmm. Where where were you located? Which in Lansing, the capital of of state of Michigan. Okay, were you working with specific colleges and universities, or just campus ministries as a whole? All, yeah, all the all the campus ministries in, in Michigan. So, mm-hmm. what is the purpose of campus ministries? Yeah, so eighty percent of our our Adventist young people go to non Adventist universities. Like you. Yeah, we would love for them to go to Southern and PUC and Andrews, but eighty percent of them of our kids don't because of finances, because of majors not offered, because of I don't know whatever reason. Uh, they go to Jewish college for, for, <laughs> for scholarships that they give. Um, so what are we doing to reach out to them? And, and these years are so formative for their future remaining 80% of their lives, what majors they're going to have, what what worldview they, they, they have. And so rather than trying to get them into Adventist universities, which if they do, even better, um, we have a ministry dedicated to one, finding these Adventists on these public universities and helping them to stay solid in the church, in the faith, but also getting them to a point where they, not us, but they are doing outreach to the students around them. And so it's a dual kind of a ministry there. And when we say outreach, what we're talking about is helping people to understand who Jesus is and working in their life. Yeah. And then ultimately to, do, to ultimately trust to and do, believe in the Bible. And if correct. you believe the Bible, then the Adventist messages correct part of and doing evangelism on the university campus not only to their peers but to their professors to the staff to it's a whole ministry out there we have you know ministry to hospitals ministry to the education level and, and, and medicine but also in the in the public education world so you've been helping with this and now you're called to Sabbath school personal ministries and communication yeah um what is the purpose of a Sabbath school personal ministries leader? Yeah, it's a good question. So that 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 particular ministry is basically the lay ministry of the church. You have ministerial who's in charge of training and inspiring, encouraging pastors. But what do the lay people do? Do lay, the lay people just sit on the side and applaud whenever the pastor baptizes and gives them tithes, or you know? No, lay people also need to be active and doing stuff. And the venue for that is a Sabbath school, uh, but there's also personal ministries that one-on-one, whether it's literature, whether it's personal preaching or uh, outreach skills and one-on-one, that's, that's what the department is really in charge of. Okay, so you serve in Michigan Conference. Mm-hmm. We're gonna kind of move this forward a little bit. Yeah. And at some point. So those are my those are my experiences. I had campus ministry, communications and Sabbath school. And I got a call in 2016 saying that the general conference is looking for someone with these three backgrounds, someone who is in the Sabbath school world for sure, who knows how to write and is in the world of communications and social media and, and, and public speaking, but also has a lot of experience with young adults. And they which couldn't is not actually. Easy to find that. Well, yeah, that, they couldn't that find three, anyone. Three uh, that, that, that's, that's what was communicated to me. And so they're like, should, should they cancel the position? Um, they talked to somebody who talked to somebody who talked to somebody. And they're like, hey, there's this weird Asian guy who may have those three experiences in Michigan. So uh, I got interviewed. And that was the clincher for me, to be honest. Because here I am. I'm working with young adults. That makes sense. Got called into communications. Okay, well, I know how to use a computer. I know how to record. I know a little bit websites and social media. Okay, communications. Sabbath school. I love the Bible. I love teaching it. I love, you know, Sabbath school. Okay. But Lord, why really these three things? But, you know, you're the Lord. I'll just be faithful in the the responsibilities you've given me. So I'll just do it. More than a paycheck, it's like you've given me this, this, this fear. Okay. And now this this responsibility on a world level is needing these three qualifications. And I'm a huge believer of trajectory, right? The Lord gives you these experiences. They may not make sense in the moment, but in hindsight, we're like, oh, because of this and this, oh, and now it makes sense now. And that that momentum helps me not to question the the weird stuff that happens now. Because I know in the future it may, it may make sense. But I mean, I have to believe in that trajectory that the Lord's leading me. So you're called 
to be the associate assistant? to the assistant director at Sabbath School and Personal Ministries at the General Conference. And you oversee Inverse. Inverse. At the is... time, it was called Collegiate Quarterly. Mm -hmm. It was the Sabbath School division for 18 to 35, but called Collegiate Quarterly. So you're young, <laughs> Gish, when you come here. Sure. Did you ever feel like a fraud? Did you ever feel like a fraud? Did you have imposter syndrome? Define define that. What, what what does that feel like? Well, I could tell you because I've experienced it. But um, like, <laughs> did you ever just like feel like you know all these people? Clifford Goldstein's down the hall from you. Yeah. You know, you talked about him. He was yeah. on, he was one of your cassette yeah. tapes. Like you're here with all these these people. Yeah. You know, it's like I remember sitting in the cafeteria like the first day, and Derek Morris came and sat yeah. down next to me, and I'm like, Yeah. Who am I, Derek yeah, Morris? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like, did you ever feel kind of like this fraud? Like. I'm Justin Kim from Michigan Conference. And I don't know if I felt like an imposter. I, f I was geeking out all the time. <laughs> you know, I was just like, that's Mark Finley. That's, that's you know, Cliff just passed by. I'm breathing the same air that came out of his nostrils, you know. Oh, goodness. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I felt very, Sorry, very. Pretty, <laughs> now it's uh, I don't feel that way anymore. Uh, <laughs> Sorry again. <laughs> very, <laughs> very privileged to be to be uh, comrades with him in, in the ministry. Um, but more like, like just in, in enamored with the responsibility. And I think what what was what, what was my drive uh, was I have this huge responsibility of this of this um, collegiate quarterly CQ. What can I do to make it better? And the Lord has called me because I'm young mm -hmm. uh, and, and because of my past experiences, I felt not qualified to be hanging out with all these other GC folk. But for this responsibility, I felt like very passionate to update, to change, to to infuse whatever past experience the Lord has given me to make it better. And if the world loves it, awesome. If not, he can fire me and I'll just go back to chopping off mice brains. Like, I, that's that's Ooh, okay. Let's with not me. go back there. Um, <laughs> Did you ever feel like because you were young mm. and you were trying to lead? I mean, it's it's an important project, mm -hmm. and we talk a lot about our young people leading the church and trying to be able to convey you know biblical truths to them that are relevant and timely for the times that we're living. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever feel like because you were young mm -hmm. that you were not accepted at the general conference? Yes. I have not felt that way. And the reason why I, I think more, I think more if I if I can add yeah. probably a more of a frustration w was um, not being understood as a young person. Uh, but that 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 lack of understanding was not an unwillingness from older generations. It was more of a. Um, uh, they weren't able to. Not quite communicating on the same. Mm -hmm. And so there was more like, oh, well, they just, they're, they're well-meaning, but they, 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 they can't. So there was, there was, I mean, I, there was no animosity on my end, but the, the, but it was a very big frustration point. Like, why, why can't they? Why don't they? But, oh, they just, they don't know how on that wavelength. So I tried to communicate as best as I can and whatnot, but I didn't feel, I didn't have that experience. So a saying I love is people get it when they get it and not a moment sooner. Hmm. And really, it's on us to try to get them to understand it. Correct. And it's like we Correct. get frustrated that they don't get Correct. it. Correct. But the bottom line is we have obviously not articulated well enough yes. to help them. Yes. Um, and so rather than us just blaming this older generation, yes. it's, it's our privilege yes. to actually be able to help them understand it in a way that makes sense to them. Right. Just like my poor teenage children have to try to make sense of things to me. Um, <laughs> So the reason why I ask that question is because, you know, sometimes there's a lot of tension within the church, like yeah. all these different generations and stuff. And my experience here at, in the GC is very similar. I've never felt looked down on because of my age mm -hmm. or my gender. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that what I actually find is a building full of leaders who genuinely want to let the world know the good news. Yeah. And yeah, sometimes there's some silos and territorial things. It is with every yeah you find you know, it really whatever anywhere. But they're just excited, yeah, 
to have other people who have that same passion. Yeah, no, I would fully agree with that. Like when before coming to GC, I thought maybe there would be like this whole, you know, liberal conservative or, you know, Western versus Eastern or black, white, racial, you know, tensions. Um, and I mean, I don't want to understand like those don't and don't exist, but I haven't I haven't tangibly experienced those. I'm sure there are undercurrents of as there are anywhere. But that the thing that was been most tangible has been a generational difference. Mm -hmm. And it's 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 forced me in my in my spiritual development and, and growth that I've always looked up to the older generation, and because I've always looked up to them, I was always I would always blame them. Why don't it's it's your the the onus is on you to understand me, and and you must take the initiative to X, Y, or Z. But I realize the greatest equalizer is they they see us not as young, but just as equal partners, and so then the onus is on on on, on like like you said on me to place myself in their shoes and try to understand why don't they understand some things. It's 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 been hard on some on on, on a lot of issues and other stuff. It's just been mind-blowingly it's been an experience. Like hey, why would they give up this for a position of insecurity for that that we, our our generation totally embraces and and helping understand issues from that perspective from their shoes has been also a growth point for me. I don't know if that was too abstract, but No, no, um, I think I I resonate with it because okay. I've I've had to kind of struggle through those yeah. same things and a struggle is a good uh, word <laughs> it, but it, it i have found it more and more to be a privilege mm. um because i realize that the work that you and i are doing is those cuspers mm -hmm. you know we get the privilege to start bridging these generations mm -hmm. and um the relevance that our children's generation wants and the generation of leaders now we get this privilege to start trying to to help them to see and to be able to speak mm -hmm. each other's languages. Mm -hmm. And um, it doesn't mean it's easy because we're trying to convey two wildly different yes. um, mindsets yes. almost. Cultures, and, if you it, will, yeah. I mean, you know, they don't necessarily fully understand social media, but, I'm, you know, we even talk about, about that because Adventist Review Ministries is, is so much more than magazines now. Yeah. But um, I sat with Billy Biaggi, who's... He's older than us. And I've never met a man so passionate about digital evangelism mm. and media. And the bottom line is he probably fully doesn't understand all of it, but he understands that it is a mechanism to preach the gospel to a whole generation, that that's where they are. Mm -hmm. And we have to meet them where they're at. Mm -hmm. And he's such an evangelist and like believer yeah. in it. And it's, it's a that's an incredible to me, that's great leadership mm. where I can champion something, even though I don't fully understand it. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's what I often see with with the leadership. But mm -hmm. it's our generation who's trying to help them to see that mm -hmm. and help them get that passion mm -hmm. so that the generations coming after us yes. can work to continue to build on that. Because um, I know we're wrapping up here with our time. I, I In the last year, you so you were Sabbath school personal ministries. You did inverse. This is gonna be like a quick fast forwarding here for a little bit. <laughs> um, you start inverse yep. on Hope Channel. Yep. Um, and I think Siku, mm -hmm. um, who was over in Sabbath school personal ministries, she was part of that program. Mm -hmm. I think Israel mm -hmm. was a part of that program. That's right. And I'm trying to remember the other face. Yeah, I, we had Sebastian Braxton and another friend, Callie Callie Buruchara, mm -hmm. and then Jonathan Walter. And yeah, we've all been friends for a very long time, but we also kind of represent different areas of the globe. I am Asia. We have <laughs> Sebastian the Braxton from Jamaica Islands, Israel from Latin America, Cali, uh, Caucasian North America, Siku from Africa, uh, Jonathan from Europe. And that we could talk about Bible stuff, do Bible study, not about the Bible, but in the Bible, mm -hmm. parsing out texts, but at the same time, like having fun. And like saying, bringing up an, uh, an experience or an insight or whatever, a teaching, and then saying, I don't see that at all, or making fun of them, or like, man, that that's you're totally making that up, and and allowing some of that 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 interaction. Um, I think we we need those two things: the fun component, and then the Bible truth, and just kind of they don't always two the two don't always mesh well, and the wrong combos can be disastrous. But we in the right combo, the right recipe, it's just becomes a nice experience and um, 
I think our, our, our show is a good example of that. So last fall, I don't know if you get a phone call, if you get a visit from somebody. Did it take you off guard slightly to know that they were considering you as the editor? Yeah, totally. Totally. It, 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 it felt like, you know, I'm, I'm here in the little leagues and we would like you for the pitch for the, the World Series kind of like, I don't know if I can use a baseball illustration, but. Um, well, you just did. I just so, did. I mean, we'll go but with it. just felt very like, there's totally not on my radar whatsoever. When I heard um, that you had been selected, I couldn't think of a more perfect individual. Oh, you're kind. You're, um, and I and I hope that when everybody has heard your life story and they've seen this passion, your life experiences help you to be able to relate to so many different people. Your passion, it, it's it's just, it's contagious. <laughs> Listening to you talk about your love for, for Christ and how he has transformed you and how we just want the whole world to know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that bridging of those gaps between the generations, Adventist Review, to me, you, I was so excited because all of those things, I think, are going to uniquely mold exactly where Adventist Review Ministries needs to go. Hmm. You know, when you sat there oh, at in Michigan thinking like, <laughs> oh, God's using these three different things to bring me here. You know, and I think we often think this like, oh, God. Oh, and then look, I, I've gotten here. Right. Actually, he's now using your time at inverse and being able to understand that to take you to this next place. Yeah. It, this 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 to here was not just the end game. You know, and it's yeah. like we don't understand God's end games. Um. I've been an Adventist review reader for years. I, I actually read the physical magazine since oh, since I was awesome. married. Awesome. Um, Kids View, you know, awesome. all of that. I know it, right? <laughs> um, it's near to my family's heart because mm. of my husband's time there. Mm -hmm. Justin, if you could identify, I mean, you now had long enough that you know this, okay? What is your desire, your heart's desire? for the magazine moving forward for as long yeah. as God allows you the privilege sure. to stay here. Sure. So like on a, on a, um, on like a cold, you know, sterile level, we do want to update some of the, the forms of digestion of media digestion that, that the Adventist review has. So that's kind of on a, on the business answer, like it was so beautiful social media and a great app and you know, all the technical stuff, but on a, on a, on a message content level, um, like you're just Adventism has so much to offer. Um, it, it's, it's a worldview. It, it's, it's not, um, in another a piece of article, uh, not another uh, uh, clothing, an article of clothing that you put on, it's it's the glasses by which you see the entire world, and so we hope that that Avenus Review and its and its various uh, products and, and shows and whatever pieces of, our, of, of uh, media out there um, helps us view the world in light of what Adventism truly is. What Jesus is doing something right now, like real time in vivo, in the heavenly sanctuary. How does that impact, you know, chat GPT? How does that impact, you know, the politics that are going on? How does that impact, you know, TikTok, whether it's going to continue or not? Like making these connections and helping us make sense of the world that we're in. And, you know, it seems, is Jesus really coming back soon? Is he not? It's just some of these connecting points that we need to have introduced in, in on, a, on a world level. I hope to bring that kind of connection point to, to everyone out there. Well, I'm excited from the GC communication standpoint <laughs> um, because we already are starting to tear down some silos. Yeah, for um, sure, which is very exciting. It, and we're partnering together yes. and we're finding ways to collaborate 
more and yep. to be able to proclaim the gospel, mm -hmm. knowing where our lanes are so we can go faster in our yes. lanes, um, so we can proclaim faster and further than we have ever been before. And I'm Amen. I'm, I'm Amen. so thrilled that we were able to spend this time together. Yeah, I feel yeah, like yeah. I got to know a lot more this about is, you. Um, you'll have like to listen to mine. Okay. Oh, here we go. We can do it again sometime. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, we hope you enjoyed this episode of a &N Profiles with um, Justin Kim. If you haven't already, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast or our YouTube channel wherever you're tuning in today so you don't miss any of our future episodes. Thank you for spending this time with us and join us next week as I continue to get to know the life stories of more inspiring people. Thank you.